Well, good morning. Welcome to church. My name is Craig. For all those uh, here for the very first time, I've been blown away. Uh, just the, the different number of first-time guests we've had come through our doors every single week since we've opened up our new facility, the City House. And So if you happen to fall in that category, maybe you're newer here or uh, attending today for the very first time, it's really important that you understand that the heartbeat of our church is to be a church for those who have given up on the idea of church. So our goal has never been to become the biggest church in town or the coolest church or the shiniest church that we can get all the other church people. Like, that's never been the goal. Rather, we feel like God has called us to this community to go after those who are unchurched, those who are de-churched, those who have given up on church. They believe that church is irrelevant for their life. They think that the church does a masterful job at answering questions that literally no one is asking. And so for us, we exist to show the immense value of the local church. We have a deep burden and passion that we believe that the local church is the truest expression of Jesus Christ, and he is the hope of the world. And so, although the local church isn't perfect, this church isn't perfect. In fact, we're kind of a hot mess at times. Uh, we're striving after a God who is perfect, and he is holy, and he's worthy of our lives. And even though we fall, even though we falter from time to time, his grace and his mercy is available to us. Amen? So thank you for being here. Church, as we always do, let's put our hands together. Can we welcome our family attending online with us today? <clears throat> Whether you are uh, in vacation mode or stuck at home with sick kids, sincerely, thank you for joining us this morning. In week number three of our series entitled Parabolic, where we as a church take three weeks and look at three of the more popular parables given to us by none other than Jesus himself. In week one, we looked at the parable of the sower and establish that really the sower is anyone who spreads the message of God. And it falls on four different types of soil, a.k.a. human hearts. Last week, we looked at the parable of the rich fool. And I implored all of you, don't give your life to something as small and as minuscule as the accumulation of wealth. And we understood together that God, he blesses us so that we can be a blessing to those around us. And today as we conclude our series, I want to look and examine the parable of the talents. Parable of the talents. It's going to be a good one. So I've entitled my message this morning, Everyone Gets a Medal for Some Gold, Others Aluminum Foil. Subtitled... It's a clever title because gold is valuable and aluminum foil is not. Dash, I should have spent more time this week thinking up a shorter title, but instead set off fireworks for my kids. So before we jump in, would you pray with me once more? God, we thank you. We need you today. Would you show up? We know that your presence is here. We know that your word is not boring, but it is alive. So I pray that you would use me this morning as a vessel to teach your truth, to point people back to you, to give your glory. Our, our goal today is singular, Lord. We want to walk away from this place just a little bit more uh, formed and molded into the perfect image of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name, everyone said... Amen, amen. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 25. We're going to begin reading this morning in verse number 14, the parable of the talents. So I always uh, teach from an NIV Bible. Maybe you're newer to church here and uh, you don't quite understand. So the Bible is, it's really in different translations. So some are really thought-for-thought thought translations from the original text. Some are word-for-word. Word. Some are more paraphrased, and they're the easiest to understand. And so for me personally, I study and read from the ESV, but I love to teach from the NIV because for us, if you don't understand what I'm saying, like, what are we doing here, right? Let's, like, sleep in and eat big breakfasts. So, like, we want, it, we want it always to be translatable. And in the NIV, because understanding, it's very pedantic, it's one... 
It's meant to teach and easily translate into our, our lives. It doesn't call the parable the parable of the talents. Rather, it refers to it as the parable of the bags of gold. Reason being is that for us, when we hear the word talent, we think of God-given abilities or aptitudes. But rather, in this context, a talent is a unit of weight to determine value. So they would measure gold or silver or other precious metals, and they would give, this is X number of talents. And so just to kind of throw that out there this morning so we don't get lost in translation. Let's start reading in verse number 14. And we find Jesus teaching the crowds and he says this. Again, it will be like. So let's time out here already for a moment. We need to ask the question, what will it be like? Jesus is referring it to the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. He's saying the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So I want to take a moment here, and already within just one verse, we have several different things happening I want to zoom in on. The first is that the more accurate translation for the word servant is the word slave. And we, we don't really like the word slave, do we? Uh, the word makes us uncomfortable. It makes us think of the movie Django Unchained. It reminds us of uh, the, that wasn't supposed to be a joke, but we can laugh together. <laughs> the D is silent. It makes us think of a lot of the really like terrible and inhumane and unthinkable treatment that African Americans were subject, uh, subjected to in the 18 and 1900s. So we, we tend to shy away from the word slave, and I think that's why many translations have adapted this word servant. And so I want to help us this morning understand that biblical slavery in no way resembled what we know as American slavery, right? And maybe for you, you've felt that tension, like you've, you've read uh, in your Bibles, or maybe you listened to some dude in a podcast, or a college professor once told you that the Bible is, is rubbish, it's garbage, look at its way that it treats women, and it condones slavery. And even you, maybe, you've read verses at times, and they make you feel like icky and conflicted, and you're not quite sure how to resolve that tension, and it's important for us to understand that, that biblical slavery was much closer to our idea of indentured servanthood. So these were men and women who had the ability to earn their freedom. They were never stuck in this perpetual cycle of slavery. Another important thing for us to know is that Biblical slaves were treated with dignity and respect. In fact, the Bible talks in how slaves should be treated by their masters. Oftentimes, they were treated as members of the family. They weren't viewed as these creatures devoid of a soul or any sort of inherent worth. And many times, slaves would be key players in the family business. They would function in high levels of leadership and more like executive type roles. And we even see proof of that in today's parable. So the landowner, he, this wealthy man, he goes away and he has such trust, such relationship that he entrusts his wealth to three different slaves. So that's our starting point. Another key facet in understanding our parable is we need to understand the symbolism that, it's, that is at work. And in to do so, we have to ask the question, well, really, where do I fit into all of this? And the answer to that is that we're the slaves. God is the master, and we are the slaves. And this is, believe it or not, it's really not a new concept at all. In fact, Paul, he talks about it in Romans 6, 18. He says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. It's a biblical idea that you were always a slave to someone. Did you know that? 
For many of us outside of Christ, we were a slave to the flesh, we were a slave to death, to the, the sinful desires within us. But then Jesus steps in, and as we like to sing, Jesus changes everything. Key word, Jesus purchases us through the shed blood on the cross, and now we're no longer a slave to sin. Now we're no longer a slave to death and the plans of the enemy on our life, but we are under new ownership, much better ownership, I might add. And so the big idea of the parable is that God entrusts his resources to us. And does that just wig anyone else out this morning? Like, I think sometimes in church we say things so often they become trite and they lose their meaning. But God entrusts his resources to us. To us. Like, last I checked, we're, we're kind of a mess. We're, we're broken and we're selfish and prideful. Or at least you guys are. I'm cool. But no, like, like all of us have these issues. So the reality that God, who is good and sovereign and just, he entrusts anything to us is astounding to me. Let me ask you a question. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you to be more transparent than first service. I asked this question in first service, and like one guy raised his hand, right? First service was a bunch of liars. You have a chance to redeem them. How many of you... You've experienced a time in your life where someone entrusted something to you. They put their faith in you and you just blew it. Anyone? All right, give it up for yourselves. Only about a third of you, the rest are liars, but we'll let it pass this time. You still win. We've all experienced that. A time in our life where someone trusted us and we just dropped the ball. I was thinking on this. Uh, question this week and doing some self-reflection, and I was taken back to my sophomore year in college. So I, much like many of you, made a slew of bad decisions in college. Um, one of them happened during Crusader days. So I went to a Christian college here in Missouri for two years before transferring and finishing up my degree in Florida. And this Christian college, uh, our mascot was the crusader yeah a crusader like yeah, because obviously why wouldn't you want to highlight one of the most embarrassing seasons in christianity uh so that was cool and during crusader days it was one week a year where they would invite in all these prospective students and hang out on campus you know eat and spend the night in the dorm and really get a feel for what college life would be like. And for us, we loved Crusader days. It was the one week a year that the food in the cafeteria went from being horrific to amazing. <laughs> right? Th these, these high school seniors showed up, and out of nowhere, there's like toasted ravioli now. There's <laughs> steak. So it was a total bait and switch. Hilarious. But we loved it because we just ate like kings. So my sophomore year, we were approached by the school, and they said, Craig, um, you guys are older now. Uh, would you like to host some high school seniors for Crusader Days? And we said, absolutely we do. We would love to do that. And our job was simple. We were to hang out with these guys and take them to chapel, uh, maybe go get some ice cream, and give them that great uh, Springfield, Missouri experience. Unfortunately... What we did instead of that was convince these guys to skip chapel, break curfew, and stay out with us all night setting off dry ice bombs at our professor's houses. <laughs> I don't think they came back to the school the next year. So suffice it to say, I, I think in that moment, we betrayed the trust of the university. And that's really the idea of this parable is that there are times in our lives things are entrusted to us and we excel, we do the right thing. And then there are times we completely fumble the ball and we fail. And this is the direction that Jesus is leading us. And we're going to pick up in verse 15, one verse in, making great time this morning. He says this, 
says to one servant, he gave five bags of gold, or uh, depending on the translation, five talents. And this would be the equivalent of about $3 million. I said that first service and someone was like, amen. (laughs) What does that even mean? (laughs) I'm just giving you facts. Jesus loves you. Silence. Three million dollars. Amen. Okay. I guess I'll take any sort of response. To one, he gave five bags of gold. Three million dollars. To another, two bags, which would be the equivalent of around 1.2 million. And then to another, one bag, around 600,000. And I want you to read the underlined section with me. Each according to his ability. Say it one more time. Each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. Each according to his ability. It's a fascinating lesson that I think Jesus is teaching us here. Because we live in a society nowadays that attempts to give everyone the same grade regardless of performance. Have you noticed that? That's why like a lot of times, like nowadays, kids like sports teams, they don't even like keep score. You know, everyone gets a trophy, everyone gets a medal, everything is awesome, you're all winners, Johnny, you're the best, even though you played in the dirt the whole time (laughs) and wore the wrong jersey. Like, (laughs) it's just that if we give everyone the same grade, and don't, don't, please don't mishear me, don't get me wrong, we all have equal worth, right? Because fortunately for us, Our worth, it's not based on performance. Our worth is based on our identity. That's the place to amen. Our our worth, it comes from God. So it doesn't matter whether you're a man, a woman, a child, black, white, red, green, hot pink. We all have the same inherent worth from God as sons and daughters of God. The only obvious exception here being Denver Broncos fans. <laughs> AKA the forsaken ones. <laughs> right? Listen, I'm sorry, but like football, I think it's still like six or seven weeks till it starts. The Royals are gonna win like five more games, maybe. <laughs> we gotta get excited about something. Let the trash talk begin. So the idea is that that Jesus, he's showing us that even though we all have equal worth, we do not have equal abilities. That's something you don't hear every day. Someone just acknowledging an obvious truth. We do not have equal ability. Isn't this why the phrase one in a million exists? Man, it's just, that guy, he's one in a million. What do you mean? There's something about him. He's different, he's special, he's unique, gifted. There are certain men and women in the world that have uncanny leadership gifts. They have this ability to cast a clear vision and then the relational currency to just take people places. They will go on and they'll lead Fortune 500 companies. They, anything they touch, it just succeeds. For some of you, you have the ability to make money. Even though some of us will spend our entire lives like struggling to make ends meet, for you it's easy. You'll start a business, you'll make an investment, you'll put $200 there and before you know it, it's $2,000. It's just, it's easy for you. Some of you, you are so intelligent, you're so smart. Maybe you have an amazing memory. Maybe for you it just, Uh, information retention has always come so naturally. You walk into the room and you're just the smartest one there. What's that like, by the way? (laughs) Others of you, it's like not that you're super book smart, but you have amazing people skills. And you will also go far in life. Your relational EQ is through the roof. You walk into the room and you own it. People want to be friends with you. Your phone's blowing up, text messages everywhere. It's just you have this magnetic presence about you. For some, you are gifted uh, athletically, physically gifted. 
probably excelled in sports. There are certain things that you can train your body to do that for most of us, we just couldn't imagine. For me, for example, like there are certain preachers that I watch or I'll listen to. And please hear me. I'm not like, this isn't my attempt to fish for compliments after service. Like, no, Craig, you're amazing. You do great. Because you guys are so generous to me. You're so so encouraging. And you say, Craig, amazing sermon. Even when I know, no, that was really bad. Like, and you've always been encouraging, and, and, I, and I appreciate that. But there are guys where I'll, I'll watch these men and women communicate the word of God, and I think there's nothing that I can do. There's no skill I can obtain. Like, there's, there's nothing I can develop to be that good. Why? It's because for whatever reason, God in his sovereignty, he just put abilities in certain people. The key is we don't get to take credit for it. And that's when people become obnoxious. That there's this amazing verse in, in the Bible, and it's so convicting to me. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 4-7. This is not on the screens. He says, what makes you different than anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you act as though you didn't? Man, that's good. Oh, you're great. Your business is successful. You're super popular. I've got 50,000 followers on Instagram. What do you have that God didn't give you? If you don't believe that watch, he could take it away in a moment. It's all his. And so the countercultural truth we're forced to grapple with this morning is the acknowledgement that for some of us in the room, although we're equally loved, although we have equal worth, for some of you, you have $3 million worth of abilities. I don't know why. For others of us, we have $1.2 million. For some of us, we're, we're the one talent. We're the $600,000 servant. We have no control over the, 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 the gifts, the resources, the abilities given to us. We have no control over the amount. Here's the big idea this morning. What we do with those things is 100% on us. It literally does not matter if you're a one talent or a five talent servant of Christ. How will you steward the resources, gifts, and abilities that God has given you. Jesus goes on and he says this in verse 16. I promise we will finish this text today. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. There he is. And this wasn't just because he put it in the bank and gained interest. No, he probably went out and started a business. He, he made some wise investments. He had a few side hustles going on. He got scrappy, brought a 100% return on the master's investment. Three million bucks. Amen. So also, the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag, he went off, dug a hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. And the man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. Guys, could you imagine this moment? It's the moment that every follower of Christ dreams about. When we come to the end of our lives and we experience what the Bible talks about in 2 Corinthians, it's the judgment seat of Christ, where we stand before Jesus and we're held accountable for how well we stewarded our lives. And we have the privilege to look Jesus in the eye and say, Savior, Lord, look what I did. Look what I got to do with all of the gifts, all of the resources that you gave me. Look at the, at the ministry that was done. Look at the, the investments 
that were made. Look at the, the men and the women who were discipled. Look at the children who were formed in Christ's likeness. Look at the impact we made in our communities and in our neighborhoods. Look at the, the ministry that I was able to accomplish. I give it back to you. Oh, to hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. Now I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Then the man with two bags of gold, he also came. He said, Master, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. See, now from a fleshly perspective, this guy was not near as successful. Yeah, the, the return was the same. He brought 100% return. But the first guy brought 3 million bucks, and he only earned an extra 1.2. He came in second place, right? Not in God's eyes. God's response to this man verbatim, word for word, the same as the first. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Verse 24, then the man who had received one bag of gold came. And for us, this is the moment that we dread. This is the moment that we're forced to stand face to face, for those of us in Christ, to Jesus. And we knew all along what we should have done. It's not that we were bad people. We went to church from time to time. Didn't cheat on my wife. I went to my, my kids' ball games. I was a good guy. But I lived for myself. I knew all along the truth. I knew that God had called me to live for a higher purpose, but yet I just got distracted by the things of this world. I got distracted by the shadow mission, the shiny things, the earthly pursuits. I got distracted by the career path, and I forgot that I was created for a higher calling. Oh, to be in that moment, to stand before Jesus, and, and to find yourself attempting to make excuses, attempting to, to find justifications for your inactivity. Uh, master, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your gold in the ground. See, see here's what belongs to you. Well, God, I, did, I wasn't as gifted as, as her. I never had as much money as him. I wasn't born into a, a, a healthy, functional family like they were. Father, I didn't even meet you until I was 32 years old. It was too late at that point. I, I didn't, I wasn't this, I wasn't that. Here's the reason. So I did nothing. So I stand before you with the exact same thing you gave me to begin with. To hear these words, you wicked, lazy servant. So you know that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so that I when I returned, I would reach back with interest, received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him, give it to the one who has 10 bags, for whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance, but whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. Throw the worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a phrase that Jesus uses six times in the book of Matthew alone to describe hell, to describe eternal separation from God. So as we close this morning, I believe the question that Jesus is asking us through the parable, it's a simple question, yet deeply convicting. It's simply, were you productive? There's not a lot of lessons in the Bible that talk about our productivity. But were you productive with your life, with your money, with your relationships, with your resources, 
with your influence? Were you productive? What kind of return did you bring from the investment that God has made in you? It's a powerful and life-changing question. Now, what am I doing right now? What am I doing as a dentist? Or as a construction worker? Or as a teacher? What am I doing as an artist or a business person to bring a return, to be productive for the kingdom of God? For me, when I look at this, I, I don't think of famous preachers. I think of guys like Michael Jones. For those of you who don't know Michael, Michael serves as a, a volunteer at our church. He owns a sign company in Blue Springs. To my knowledge, Michael's never once preached a sermon. But wow, is his life productive for the kingdom of God. Every sign that you see in this building and outside of this building, and for that matter, every sign that we've had over the last four years has been done by Michael at cost. Every prop, every set, overseeing every baptism. This was a guy that pulled a trailer for us every morning, waking up at 6 a.m. for four years. These drums, for example, aren't these cool drums? Michael built the drums, y'all. He built those drums. You see this jacket? Michael sewed my, okay, so that's not true. He would have if I asked. He'd have tried. I don't think Michael's ever led a small group. I want to just witness when he gets to stand before Jesus. His life's productive for the kingdom of God. I think of guys like Steve Miller. You could not pick a person more different than me, than Steve Miller. First off, Steve likes to run. Like, running. The only reason an adult should run is if you're being chased by a large animal. We have cars now. Second thing, Steve loves those uh, tabletop role-playing games. I, on the other hand, am an adult. So there's that. So different. But man, I love Steve Miller. I have such a deep and profound respect for this man. In fact, in the last six months, I have seen no one personally sacrifice more, work harder, show more dedication than this man. When we were in our final stretch of the building, he was here with us every night, oftentimes to one, two o'clock in the morning. And it's not like he has just hours and hours and all this like extra margin in his life. He works for Honeywell. Uh, I don't know what he does. He said that if he, if he told me, he'd have to kill me. Super secret stuff. Has three kids, runs marathons. In addition to all that, just installed all of our IT in the building, installed all of our security cameras. He serves as a trustee. He oversees our security team here on Sunday mornings. And now in addition to that, as a volunteer, never been paid a penny from the church, he oversees the maintenance of this 45,000 square foot facility. He said 20 to 30 hours a week worth of work. Chasing leaks, dealing with uh, HVAC issues, scheduling cleaning crews, scheduling lawn care, patching walls, because some pastor thought it'd be a good idea to throw axes in a building. <laughs> and although Steve is incredibly intelligent, very sharp, you talk to him and he's like, this is just a normal guy, you're right. We're just normal guys. But his life counts for the kingdom of God. He's using what God has given him for the glory of God. And we are all beneficiaries of his ministry this morning. I think of people like Robin and Mike Boyt. This week, Mike was out there, 100 degrees outside, and he's on, on the lawnmower, 
just mowing the grass. Robin, this week, we're in between cleaning crews. So just out of her own, own time, just up here cleaning the church. She makes breakfast every morning for the crew that serves here. Every morning. Can you imagine the hassle? Can you imagine what other things you could be doing on Saturday night? Up here cleaning, doing all this. I can only imagine how many pieces of bacon that Robin made for Father's Day. Oh, to be there when they stand before Jesus and they say, look at the return. I think of guys like Ward Wasmer, who serves on our tech team, he's a director here. Embodies dedication. Hand soldered, just to save the church a little money, hand soldered all of the cables for our AVL. Number one, who does that? Number two, how do you do that? I just don't know. So many people, I think of guys like Kevin Fain, Carrie Clay, Nikki, Alex Jingles, guys like Joe Riggs, Zach Corns, Chuck and Gina Noah. I think of my man right here who last service, he didn't hear me, so he didn't react. Scotty Moon. Give it up for Scotty Moon. Huge heart for discipleship. Serves on our prayer team. Man, just a difference maker for the kingdom of God. Were you productive? We don't know how long this life lasts, man, but I want my life to count. Are you a five talent, a three talent, a one talent person? You know what? It doesn't matter. Are you faithful to what God has given you? Don't waste your life. Don't be like the foolish and wicked servant who dug a hole in the ground. Make your life count. It doesn't have to be here. Make your life count for God. Glorify God in everything you do. That's my prayer. I want all of us to be able to hear those words one day. Well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant. You were faithful with the little that I gave you. Come on. Come share in your master's happiness. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you're slow to anger, that you are very patient, gracious with us, that we have a tendency to, to lean towards selfish ambition. We have a, a tendency to lean towards selfishness and, and pride, but yet you're just grace. It's, it's continuous. It's always there. Forgive us of the times that we just choose to live for ourselves. Forgive us of the times that we spend our lives chasing after earthly pursuits that will be just whisked away, that will serve no eternal purpose. Help us steward well the, the money, but also abilities, resources that you've given us. Because we know that to whom much is given, much is expected. So Father, for every five talent person in this room, every three talent, every one talent person, I pray that we would all be able to stand before you as faithful, as walking the straight and narrow, as refusing to give our lives to a lesser calling. This is our warning. This is our correction. Help us make the changes today to live differently, to live for eternity, to be productive for the kingdom of God. With every head bowed, every eye closed, listen, I'm not going to have you raise your hands this morning, but I do want you to, I want to create some space to have a heart response. I want to ask two very quick questions. The first, I think for many of us in this room, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit throughout the teaching of, of God's word that we're told does not return void has brought conviction. Notice I didn't say guilt, conviction. Conviction brings life, guilt brings death. 
Conviction calls us to the higher things of God. Uh, guilt, it, it keeps us in perpetual brokenness and death. Conviction says, hey, there's another way. There's a better way. God's called you to more. Turn, move away. And maybe through the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit in this moment, you're realizing that, wow, like my life is just honestly not that productive for the kingdom of God. And I don't think it's necessarily my job to specifically tell you what those things are, but I, I believe it's my job to tell you that you need to ask God and God, if we ask, we receive. That's what the word says. In what ways is God calling you to use your gifts, your abilities, your talents for the production, for, for the kingdom return? Because you will be held accountable for that. So walk out those doors and then do something different. Live differently. Act differently. Love differently. Think differently. Plan differently invest differently secondly maybe you're here and you're like realizing well craig how can i be productive for god i'm really new to this church maybe you're here maybe you haven't stepped foot in a church for years maybe ever and i'm here to just simply say this the first step in living a life as a difference maker as someone who brings a great return for god's glory is to initiate that through a relationship with god's son jesus christ and so if you're here and, and you're realizing you've never truly, genuinely, I'm not saying like, oh, I, I raised my hand one time because the preacher literally scared the hell out of me. I, I, he gave me that turn or burn message and so I, I just didn't know what to do. Uh, that's not why we turn to God. Those are scare tactics. That we don't use those here. We don't use manipulation, we use invitation. So maybe you're here and, and you just, realizing that I have never with a full heart called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, surrendered my life to him. If that's you, right where you sit, in your own words, speak this out and begin to realize, number one, just say, God, you have not been first place in my life. Would you forgive me of that? My, my career has, my, my family has, my relationships, my reputation. God, as of today, you are now Number one, so I just realized that. Number two, I believe, I believe that Jesus, you died for my sins. You died for my sins. And even though they put you in the grave, you rose again three days later. And as the word of God tells us, you are alive today. Number three, you need to accept the free gift of God's grace. Notice that I said free. It's free to us, but it came at an extraordinary cost. Don't try to earn it, you can't. Simply accept the free gift of God's grace and forgiveness. And lastly, invite Jesus into your life to be the Lord of your life. God, we give that to you. We thank you for every person right now in this room making that decision to follow you. We believe all of heaven celebrates, all of heaven goes crazy when one lost son or daughter comes back home. Lord, in Luke 15, you paint such a clear picture of your heart for the one lost. You leave the 99 in search of the one. There will be more celebration over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not repent. Father, every person right now who's just thinking and they're praying and they're discerning how we can live differently and live lives uh, of productivity for you, Lord, I pray you would give us wisdom, give us discernment, um, guide us put people into our lives that can speak counsel and words of wisdom and truth to help us navigate those decisions. Help us live differently. God bless our church. Our city is so broken, so desperately in need of Jesus. Help us be a church arm in arm with the other great churches in our city to see revival take place and independence in the greater Kansas City area and to the ends of the earth. Help us steward well the gifts you've given to us, God and we will give you the glory. We won't take an ounce of the credit. It's all for you. We love you, we thank you, and it's in the mighty name of Jesus, everyone said, amen.